Tonight, one man's devastating choice to end his life after a horrific hospital stay. Four days in an ER left him with a bed sore that couldn't be cured. It's pure neglect. It's, it's the only word that comes to mind. Why he felt a medically assisted death was his best option. A last ditch effort to rescue a trapped orca calf is paused. It's obviously very stressful for the animal and it can be dangerous. The daring plan to get her to safety. Tax deadline is just weeks away. It feels really complicated, it feels very stressful. We break down the surprisingly simple tips you need to know before you file. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansing. Experts and disability advocates are raising concerns tonight over a medically assisted death they say should never have happened. A Quebec man chose to end his life after a trip to hospital left him with a terrible wound. Normand Mounier died at the end of March. Hours spent on an emergency room stretcher led to him developing a bed sore. The ensuing agony and infection led him to end his life. Before that moment arrived, he invited our cameras into his home and told Radio Canada reporter David Gentile what led to his decision. For the last two years, Sylvie Brosseau cared day and night for her partner Normand Meunier. His arms and legs were paralyzed in 2022. Ah, but it was a trip to a Quebec hospital that ultimately led him to choose a medically assisted death. In January, Meunier was admitted to St. Jérôme's ER for a severe infection. 95 ans à l'urgence sur une civière. Inacceptable. For four days, he was stuck on a stretcher with a firm mattress. But he needed a therapeutic mattress that shifts pressure points on its own to avoid sores developing. Brosseau asked for one repeatedly. Mais le matelas arrive jamais. Jamais, jamais, jamais. Overwhelmed staff also never moved him themselves. He developed a gaping bed sore. So bad, muscle and bone were exposed. Treatments did not work. Mon médecin, il est venu me voir et il dit euh, l'infection est rendue dans tes os. His doctors told him they could not save his life. Facing a slow, agonizing death, he asked to receive medical assistance in dying and was accepted. It's pure neglect. It's, it's the only word that comes to mind. This advocate for people with disabilities fears people are turning to medical assistance in dying because of the lack of proper care. It is becoming an alternative to decent, to decent care and, and the numbers will explode because it's there. And this case of Mr. Muni will we'll put that in light. The local health authority says it has 145 mattresses with alternating pressure. An internal investigation is now underway to figure out why Meunier couldn't get one. Facing his death, Meunier told us he did not want to be a burden. Moi, je veux être capable de prendre celui dans mes bras. He died at home the following day, surrounded by his loved ones. Such a tragic story, David. And experts say this needs to be a wake-up call. Well, some people see it uh, as, uh, as a concern because it would illustrate a widespread crisis within Quebec's healthcare system. And some experts argue that for some frail, fragile patients, it could become easier to get medical assistance to die than to get proper health care. Internal investigations are going on at the hospital, and Provincial Health Minister Christian Dubé has said that if the answers are not satisfactory, the province itself could lead its own investigation. David Gentile in Montreal. After a series of announcements ahead of the federal budget, the Liberals have finally released their complete housing strategy. Called the Canadian Housing Plan, the goal is to add about 3.9 million homes, including rental units, within the next seven years. According to the Parliamentary Budget Office, Canada will need to build 3.1 million homes by 2030 to ease the housing crisis. This strategy would close that gap if it works as advertised. But Rafi Bujikanian shows us there is already pushback. 
housing supply. The government's flurry of housing announcements from the last few weeks has built to this. We are releasing the most comprehensive and ambitious housing plan ever seen. This latest policy focused on boosting the supply of new homes. We're going to do that by reducing the cost of home building, by putting tax incentives on the table for builders, low cost financing. We're also going to be launching new measures that help unlock federal lands. That means opening up more public land for construction, either through sale or lease, up to $40,000 in low interest loans for homeowners to build secondary suites and allowing builders to write off more taxes by recouping up to 10% of costs from projects that have lost value. We're seeing language and a scale of an initiative that I've never seen before. All that is a start in addressing the gap, especially in rental housing, says this former Toronto city planner, now a developer. Rental housing is so incredibly expensive that there's nothing left at the end of the month to start saving for a down payment. So having a little bit of a surplus or oversupply of rental housing would be really good for young people. But some provinces say Ottawa is muscling in on their turf. We handpicked six different municipalities to work directly with and left over 340 other municipalities out in the cold. Hammered by provinces and opposition conservatives months ago for saying housing is not primarily a federal responsibility, Trudeau is now pushing back. Provinces should be careful what they wish for. They want the federal government to fix this housing crisis? We are. We will. The government wants to build nearly 4 million homes in the next seven years. Some details are still under wraps, including exactly how public land will factor into this. The Liberals hoping to save some spotlight for the budget next week. Rafi Bujikan, CBC News, Ottawa. The director of CISA says he stands by the spy agency's work, but after the last day of public hearings into foreign interference, there are still questions about what the government knows and its response. Ashley Burke takes us through it. The head of Canada's intelligence agency back to defend his work. Intelligence is a, uh, is a very sophisticated approach. David Vigneault told the inquiry, intelligence about election meddling is a puzzle. Sometimes we are building that picture, but I think what is important to remember is that uh, this is done by uh, professional, uh, trained uh, intelligence analysts. That comment after the Prime Minister said he doesn't always trust intelligence CSIS shares. That includes an initial report Trudeau says was unverified, that China may have interfered in a Liberal nomination race in 2019. No government, no uh, leader should simply be a passive receiver of uh, information and intelligence. We have a role to play in, uh, in uh, asking questions. Over the course of 10 days, more than 40 witnesses, including top civil servants, political parties, and the prime minister himself, provided evidence about efforts of countries, including China, to influence the past two federal elections. The commission heard the results weren't impacted, but there were vulnerabilities exposed. The community doesn't feel safe. Diaspora community groups said they were threatened. It touches your life. It touches your safety. It touches your security. Candidates who said they were targeted called out the government for failing to warn them. It's almost like I was drowning and they are watching. And the prime minister's inner circle said CSIS didn't communicate everything it wrote down on paper including stark warnings in a briefing note from 2022. We have never heard language uh, like the stuff that are that is in this uh, in this document. Vigneault said those warnings, including that Canada is falling behind its allies, were shared on other occasions. So, Ashley, the fact finding stage of the inquiry has wrapped up. What's next? Well, Ian, it's now up to the commissioner and her team to piece together this puzzle. They are the only ones that have seen all of the evidence that includes unredacted top secret documents and testimony from in-camera hearings with officials about state secrets. The commission's interim report is due in three weeks, then the inquiry will head into its next phase, investigating if Canada has the capacity to detect and counter the threat. Ashley Burke in Ottawa. A former Canadian Space Agency engineer has been acquitted of a breach of trust charge related to his dealings with the Chinese aerospace company. The RCMP accusing Wanping Zheng of using his position to act on behalf of the Chinese firm 
after his actions were flagged by CSIS, but he said he was only trying to help out Canadian companies by linking them up with a client. The Quebec judge said the Crown failed to prove he committed a crime. A daring rescue operation to save a stranded orca calf off the coast of northern Vancouver Island is suspended this evening. It's been stuck in a lagoon and orphaned after its pregnant mother became trapped by a low tide and died. Tanya Fletcher's tracking developments for us. And Tanya, it sounded like this was underway, then suddenly paused. What happened here? Yeah, in a very fluid situation, eight-hour attempt all day, and in the end, they say she was just evading every maneuver they tried to get her into a sling. That's the plan right now, is to get her into a big sling, move that by crane into a massive flatbed truck with rails that's waiting on shore, and then transport it out, possibly by boat then, to take the whale into open water and hopefully reunite her with her pod. We talked to an expert at DFO, and he says that plan isn't the preferred scenario, but more of a last resort. It's something that we wish we didn't have to do because it's obviously very stressful for the animal and it can be dangerous. Um, but at this point, it's probably the best, uh, the, this, this animal's best chance of, uh, of going back to the open sea and then hopefully finding a, a family group to, uh, to live with. And so, Tanya, take us through some of the challenges that this crew's facing. Yeah, I mean, you've got the, the geography itself. They have to have the weather, the tides. All of these variables need to line up and lock in all at once in order for this rescue attempt to be successful. And once that happens, will it even survive after it makes it out into the open water? They've had, had helicopters looking for its pod to make sure it's in the right position. So all of those things still need to happen. The good news, they say, the veterinarians have been able to look at her this morning. She appears to be in good health and is solid uh, breathing and swimming well. So that's the good news. We'll wait and see when the next attempt will be and how they'll attempt it, Ian. Tanya Fletcher watching our story from Vancouver. A new warning from Ottawa tonight for Canadians to avoid all travel to Israel. This comes as the country braces for a retaliatory attack from Iran. It could happen at any time despite blunt calls from the U.S. for Tehran to stand down. Margaret Evans now with the efforts to avert a wider conflict. In Gaza... The daily fight to survive grinds on. The fervent wish of so many Gazans and of Israeli relatives of hostages held by Hamas is for a ceasefire. But warnings from Washington of what it calls a credible threat that Iran is planning an imminent attack against Israel have raised fears of escalation. My expectation sooner than later. Mr. President, to Iran in this moment? Don't. Washington has sent its top general to Israel in a gesture of support, meeting with Israel's defense minister. Our enemies think they can pull Israel and the United States apart, says Yoav Gallant, but the opposite is true. Israel is widely believed to have been behind an attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus earlier this month, but reportedly didn't inform Washington ahead of time. Seven people were killed, including two top Iranian generals, prompting Tehran to promise retaliation. But they fear at the end of the day, any direct clash with Israel will bring in the United States and the UK and other Western powers, and that's the Iranian leader, leaders do not really want uh, to take risks, strategic risks, uh, mm. and attack Israel directly. Some analysts, including Fawaz Gerges, believe if there is a retaliatory attack, it could come from one of Iran's many proxies in the region. The most powerful Hezbollah in Lebanon has been firing rockets at Israel since October 7th. There were more on Friday night. By attacking Iran's sovereignty, Israel is wittingly or unwittingly expanding or trying to expand the conflict, which goes against the overarching goal of the Biden administration. Whether there is or isn't a direct attack against Israel by Iran, the potential for things to spin out of control in the Middle East is never very far from the surface. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Johannes Revoir, a priest accused of sexually abusing children in Nunavut, has died after a long illness. 
The Oblates of Mary Immaculate confirmed his death today, the religious order apologizing to anyone harmed by Rivoire, saying it regrets that he will never face charges and it was unable to formally remove him as a priest. A new study is debunking a myth about COVID vaccines. It shows there is no evidence that mRNA shots cause fatal cardiac arrest in young people. Tashana Reed now with a closer look at the data. We don't know, of course, the extent of his injuries. When NFL player DeMar Hamlin collapsed during a game last year, it fueled online misinformation claims that blamed the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine for his cardiac event. He recovered, but that didn't stop the rumors. The claims that vaccines cause cardiac deaths in young people just isn't true. Now, a new study published by the CDC says there's no link between COVID vaccines and fatal heart problems in young adults. Researchers looked at the death certificates and immunization records of nearly 1,300 young people in Oregon, ages 16 to 30, who died of a heart condition or undetermined cause. Three had died within 100 days of receiving the vaccine. Two of those deaths were attributed to chronic underlying health conditions. The third was an undetermined natural cause. It's a tragedy to think of it this way, but you take a large enough group of people, a certain number of them are going to die during your study period from all of the other things that can cause death. During the study period, 30 teens and young adults had died from COVID-19. Most were unvaccinated. The Oregon study was in response to reports of heart muscle inflammation called myocarditis after vaccination. While the inflammation did happen, the vast majority of children recovered because it was relatively mild and they were fine afterwards. Experts say confronting misconceptions about vaccine safety with evidence is still important. This study adds to a wide variety of others that show that vaccination actually decreases the overall risk of cardiac problems. As for Hamlin, it was revealed that a precise hit to his chest during the game triggered a rare cardiac condition. Maybe I can inspire people to make an impact and make a change. He now advocates for CPR training. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. An industry that boomed during the pandemic has now hit hard times. All right, here's the unit. Has all your everything you need from home on wheels. Why RVs are such a tough sell these days. Next. Plus, with tax season in full swing, Canadians have questions. I wouldn't be so confused about it if I had someone in school teaching me. Some important advice from a tax expert. And later, rescued from illegal hunters and nurtured by hand. So they're having to be bottle fed around the clock. The moment 16 bear cubs got a second chance, we're back in two. One person was killed, 13 others hurt when this stolen semi-trailer crashed into a public safety building in Texas near Houston. Police say it may have been deliberate. The driver was denied a commercial license yesterday, which were issued in the building. Five people remain in hospital. In southwestern Russia, thousands of people have been forced to evacuate as rising water levels push a main river to over 11 meters high. It's just one of the waterways bursting in Russia and Kazakhstan. Authorities say it's the worst flooding in nearly a century in those areas. If you're on the hunt for an RV ahead of the summer, you are in luck. It is a buyer's market. As Paula Dehatchik shows us, the pandemic-era frenzy to purchase these vacation vehicles has not only fizzled out, people are struggling to get rid of the ones they have. All right, here's the unit. Jason Huntley bought this RV in 2018, but with his kids growing up, he's trying to sell. Has all your, everything you need from home on wheels. Emphasis on trying. It's been listed online almost a year. I've uh, let the ad expire, as you would say, and then restarted it a few times. Uh, but interest is pretty minimal. Problem is, the market is very different from a few years ago. RV sales surged during the pandemic. It was a way that people could still travel and have family vacations while staying close to home. But these days, people who can afford to go on vacation can take an airplane to get there. 
Plus, amid high interest rates and inflation, other people who may want an RV just can't afford one anymore. People have a little bit less discretionary income, and so they may have delayed their purchasing. People aren't just putting off their purchases. A growing number are also selling off their RVs using the website rvdealers.ca. We get people trading in their units, um, and we also have the certain cases where uh, people maybe decided to just get out of the lifestyle completely. It was basically turbocharged uh, demand, and that's not sustainable per permanently. Still, this analyst thinks the industry will bounce back. Many of these customers are going to stay in the outdoor lifestyle, and I think that's going to help sell more RVs longer term because you're going to have a wider customer pool than you did pre-pandemic. As for seller Jason Huntley, he still expects some short-term trouble unloading his RV. I don't believe we've seen like the worst of it yet. He's still hoping to sell, but isn't holding his breath. Paula Duhacek, CBC News, Calgary. There's growing concern about the unverified content teens face in the online world. I saw my friend, the, the TikTok post about it, and it turned out to be fake. New efforts to help them fact check what's on their screens. Plus, as Putin's grip on Russia grows, so does the disinformation coming from the Kremlin. The ordinary Russians have learned to speak the language of Putinism. How he uses propaganda to keep Russians in line. Plus, the deadline to file taxes just weeks away. Gave me too much grief and stress. Yeah. Just pay somebody to do it. Some expert advice on how to maximize your returns. The National breaks down the stories shaping our world. Next. That was the sound of the McNeil Lair News Hour. Pioneered by Robert McNeil, the Canadian-born broadcaster and author has died at the age of 93. We're going to bring you the entire proceedings in the first day of the Senate Watergate hearings. That deep voice and straight, no-nonsense style was a hit on PBS in the 1970s. Before that, McNeil worked for the CBC and the BBC and covered JFK's assassination live for NBC. Three shots were heard. Three shots were heard. He was a fierce critic of sensationalism in TV news. Some of those newcomers, they are sucking the networks down that path. The defense of journalistic principles was his life and now his legacy. The media landscape sure has changed a lot since then, especially for teens who get much of their news from social media, where misinformation can run rampant. Deanna Sumanag-Johnson shows us how some are learning to scrutinize what they're seeing online. If uh, we want to go even deeper onto this, we can... He writes for his school newspaper, but even Samir Ferdosi once fell for a post falsely advertising a Drake concert. Immediately I saw my friend, the, the TikTok post about it, and it turned out to be fake. But with new fact-checking skills he learned while attending a workshop run by the media literacy company Media Smarts, that's not likely to happen anymore. We take any images, and if it's a video, we take a screenshot and take that image, and we reverse image search it, right? And if this thing has been published, republished from a previous article or source, we understand that it's kind of fake or it's a little misleading. Um, Samir is one of a few young Canadians chosen to join an elite international squad of teens making TikTok videos to teach other teens about misinformation and fake posts online. This is not legit. Be aware that these false posts might use photos or videos out of context. Media Smarts is leading the Canadian project. They're speaking the same language, they you know, tend to be consuming the same kinds of media and on the same platforms and so there's a credibility factor that's really important. Because immediately... It's not the only project of its kind. There was a couple of people who are laughing. This New Brunswick teacher has been using the Control F videos from education group Civics to talk to her students about misinformation online. I don't see that moment of glowing happiness when they learn this. It's definitely more a source of frustration. But what I do appreciate and love with the students when we talk about this is that afterwards um, that they're heavily engaged in conversation about what is reliable and what is not. But is it covering the whole story? 
a conversation Samir Ferdosi hopes to contribute to. If we search up Prada, space for NASA. Becoming an influencer who can influence other teens to look carefully at what they're consuming. That's why it's always good to check. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Now it's time to dig deeper into the news shaping our world. Canada's tax deadline's coming up fast. What you need to know to maximize your return. But first, re-elected at home and pushing ahead in Ukraine. Vladimir Putin now ramps up his propaganda machine. Russia is fighting against the evil West. Russia is defending itself. With the death of a popular rival, Putin's grip on public discourse is tighter than ever. The people who buy the state's narrative will always outnumber those who don't. Vladimir Putin has long used propaganda for power and control. Terence McKenna shows the new lengths he's going to. Here is Vladimir Putin on the night after his recent re-election in a campaign where no credible opponent was allowed to run. He's attending a Moscow rally to celebrate the 10th anniversary of his annexation of Crimea, the first part of Ukraine he invaded and occupied in 2014. They sing the anthem and songs imploring the audience to come to the aid of the motherland and support the Russian troops fighting now to take over more of Ukraine. Putin's message used to be that Ukraine was a separate country that had been taken over by Nazis. Now he says there never was a separate Ukraine, that the occupied Ukrainian territories are only returning to where they belong, that they were always part of Russia. Putin's message is amplified every day by propagandists on Russian TV, like Putin's former prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev. Когда-то один из бывших руководителей Украины сказал, что Украина это не Россия. Вот эта концепция должна исчезнуть навсегда. Украина это безусловно Россия. You can also encounter Putin's favorite themes on Moscow street signs and in Russian street interviews. Потому что это исконно русские земли. Украины такой вообще не было никогда. Была окраина России, да. Только это исторические, исконно вот русские земли были. Are they using the same, in particular, propaganda strategies? And what do we think they're going to do as a result? In Kingston, Ontario, Queen's University political scientist Ian Garner specializes in Russia and now teaches a course about Russian propaganda. The ordinary Russians have learned to speak the language of Putinism. We can detect, even amongst people who don't claim to be particularly fond of the regime, tropes, narratives, images and ideas that we can trace back directly to state propaganda sources. And that suggests that the propaganda is effective. Another Putin theme is that Russia had to attack Ukraine, otherwise Russia would have been attacked by the West. That too is repeated on the streets. Masha Lipman is a Russian journalist who fled the country at the time of the 2022 invasion. She thinks the Russian audience is very receptive to Putin's messages. I would say the main thing is that this is a defensive war that Russia is fighting against the evil West and first and foremost the United States. Russia is defending itself. It is not uh, comfortable for people to think that your country is evil and doing something wrong. The Internet 1420 channel mainly interviews ordinary Russians in the street. Airport. 
We have visited producer Daniel Orion several times in the last two years. He says he now has to interview many more people to find anyone who openly disagrees with Putin. I remember two years ago we needed 27 people and at least a couple of them will be like, I hate Putin, I hate this war and everything. Right now, 50 or more. But uh, a lot of people, even more people, uh, refuse to participate than before. Last summer, Russia unveiled a new history textbook for high school classrooms. Gone are any criticisms of Russian dictatorships past. Instead, there are glowing endorsements of the policies of Vladimir Putin and especially of his war on Ukraine. It is true that indoctrination in schools and colleges has become quite powerful and quite broad in Russia. And this has changed quite dramatically since the war. The indoctrination is done through uh, special classes of patriotism to teach Russians to be patriotic. And basically, patriotic means not to challenge the government policy. So I'm going to ask Russians. When the school year began, Daniel Orion found a few people to disagree with the textbook's assertion that the West is Russia's number one enemy. The ISIS attack on the Crocus concert hall in Moscow provided a window into the Putin propaganda model. It might have been seen as a huge security failure of his regime. But Putin quickly went on the air with the suggestion that Ukraine might somehow be involved. Shortly thereafter, one of his favorite TV propagandists, Margarita Simonyan of the Russia Today channel, blamed Ukraine without any qualification or evidence. Where Putin just simply raises a possibility, perhaps it was Ukraine. Another figure like Simonyan will chip in right at the other end of the spectrum and say, no, it definitely was. And then we will find a chorus of voices along those, that spectrum until the state has established, as it seems to have done already, this was absolutely Ukraine, there is no doubt about it. Of course, the radical reception fed out by the propaganda machine is designed to distract people from an obvious central issue in the Moscow terrorist attack. How, despite multiple warnings, the Putin government did nothing to prevent it. This is a huge, gigantic failure, but uh, this is not, of course, how it is portrayed. Whether Russian law enforcement and whether Russian security services are efficient or inefficient, this is not what is uh, allowed to discuss in public. The people who buy the state's narrative will always outnumber those who don't because the state's control of mainstream media, but also online and digital media, which is far more significant in shaping opinion, is so strong and really so absolute and complete. Mr. President, thank you. On February 22nd, 2022, you addressed your country in a nationwide address when the conflict in Ukraine started. The Russian propaganda machine is not just aimed at the internal audience. Tucker Carlson's much discussed interview with Putin enabled the Russian leader to reach a wide international audience. When it comes to external Western audiences, being interviewed by Tucker Carlson, who has an enormous reach online, albeit not through mainstream media, allowed Putin to reach, I believe there's over 100 million views on X Twitter within a couple of days. That's an enormous amount of people. Russia also floods Western social media with disinformation through robot accounts. This year, Russia will attempt to influence elections in many democratic countries. It is absolutely time for Western governments to get real about how big this problem is and to understand once and for all that Russia isn't just tinkering around the edges of our society. It is deep in the heart of our political discourse. It is influencing elections. It in is influencing everyday behavior. And that means reframing our thinking, stopping Russian bots and trolls, stopping Russians' ability to actually post and disseminate information online before it arrives on in our spaces. 
Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny provided a great counterpoint to the Putin propaganda apparatus. The death of Navalny is unquestionably a blow to the resistance movement in Russia. I think this was a hope that some people had, uh, that someday he would be released or something will happen. He will uh, emerge once again free and independent and strong and unafraid. Uh, but now this person is no more, and uh, of course this will have a uh, depressing effect and al of, uh, already has had a depressing effect on people. Красавчик. Yes. Вы жизненно бы сделали его президентом? Нет. Почему? Ну, он и так практически по жизни был президент. Мне кажется, уже как-то перемен требует наши сердца. Two years ago, the younger generation in Russia was generally much more skeptical about Putin's war in Ukraine. But his school indoctrination programs are designed to change that over the years ahead. Resistance in Russia is slowly but surely being overwhelmed by the Putin propaganda machine. When it comes to the state of independent media that Terence McKenna touched on there, advocacy group Reporters Without Borders ranks Russia 164th out of 180 countries. Coming up with tax season here, some tips from an expert to make sure you make the most of your return. That's next, plus. 16 bear cubs are safe tonight after what's being called a historic rescue how they're now being raised by hand. That's coming up. Have you filed your taxes? Of course already, I did. The April 30th tax deadline is right around the corner. Are you ready? Have you filed your taxes? No. If you're not looking forward to it, you're not alone. A lot of Canadians have troubles filing their taxes. It feels really complicated, it feels very stressful. But it doesn't have to be. Our tax expert will help you minimize the pain and maximize the gain this year. Well, with just a couple of weeks to go before the deadline, let's check in with David Rothfleisch, a tax lawyer and chartered accountant. And David, we asked you, what would be at the top of your list for our viewers when it comes to taxes? And, and number one you said was to file on time. Why is that so important? The reason it's so important and the reason why we tell clients, we tell taxpayers, we tell everybody on uh, taxpage.com that if you don't file your return on time, you've incurred an immediate 10% penalty for nothing because eventually you are going to file your return or you're going to go to jail. So you're going to file the return. Why not file it on time? Okay, you can't afford to pay. I understand it's a problem. You may have cash flow later on. You may not have cash flow later on, but regardless, if you file the return by April 30th, you avoid that immediate 10% penalty. What happens if you don't owe taxes? Well, then you probably get a refund, so you might as well file as well. And if you don't file it by April 30th, you're gonna forget about it. You know, who thinks about filing tax returns on July 15th? Yes. So file your return, April 30th. Okay. Uh, number two on your list is dealing with medical expenses. What's, what's your short bit of advice on that? So Einstein famously said the hardest thing in the world or the most difficult thing in the world to understand is the income tax. Medical expenses goes into that category. So you'd think it's very straightforward. However, the way you can claim medical expenses is for any 12-month period ending in the calendar year. So you could claim medical expenses for January 2nd, 2022 to January 1st, 2023. Is that the most advantageous claim to make, or is it a claim from mid-2022 to mid-2023? Also, should you claim it? Should your spouse claim it? How do you go about claiming it? So these are calculations that, on the face of it, are somewhat complex. It's not just a question of, let's accumulate them all in a, a box and claim them, claim them all. You have to time when you're claiming your expenses. There are also expenses that you might not think of, for example, if you have to travel more than 40 kilometers for medical treatment, that's deductible. If you have to renovate your house to make it more accessible because you have a disability, that's a deductible expense. So you're a tax lawyer, you're a chartered accountant, as I mentioned. I mean, how does the average person who doesn't want to hire somebody figure out how to navigate what to do with those uh, medical expenses? So if you are 
the average person and you have minimal expenses, you, you probably fake it. But if you have any substantive amount of medical expenses, and also there is a floor 3% of net income before you can even claim your medical, medical expenses, it probably is cost justified to retain an accountant to do these calculations for you. All right, uh, we sent our producer Andrew out to go talk to some people on the street and uh, asked uh, some people if they have tax questions. I want to play one of those for you now. I wonder uh, to what degree the work from home um, tax benefit is still in play now that we're kind of in this flexible world of sometimes we work from home and sometimes we don't. Uh, sometimes there's a one day a week we work from home. Does that mean we get to, we get to still um, you know, claim that on our taxes? David, what's your answer for her? Well, the twist at the end, one day a week, makes it a little more difficult. So one of the benefits of COVID is that CRA is a much more relaxed now about claiming at-home ex work expenses. So you can definitely claim home office expenses in the right circumstances. So there are a number of hoops to go through as usual. The first one is you have to have a form from your employer, a form T2200-2200, that says my employee has to work from home and can claim expenses. Once you have that, if you work a minimal or, or if you work a prescribed amount of time from home, then you get to claim those expenses. And in order to claim those expenses, you have to file a form T777, so T777 form, and you have to do the calculation of what your expenses are, and then you get to claim them. And those are pre-COVID rules. So the mm -hmm. T2200, the T777 are all pre-COVID rules. So we're back to the rules from before, except that CRA now ac accepts that taxpayers will sometimes do a joint, sometimes home, sometimes office type of arrangement. It's a lot more common. It's a lot more accepted now, whereas before COVID, it, it wasn't heard of. I want to squeeze in two more questions in less than a minute. So you, you need to work with me on this, David. I'm sure you okay. will. RRSPs, I assume the, uh, the advice continues to be max out if you possibly can? Max out as soon as you can, as early as you can, because it's compound tax-free earnings. Contribute now if you can. Contribute throughout the rest of the year. Don't wait till February 28. And, and what about software, the software that can help people with their taxes? Uh, is it, is it, do they work? Of course they work. They've been working for years. Accounts have used software forever. And the home software now is excellent. It's very useful. It'll take you through. But don't fall into the trap of thinking, I don't need an accountant because I have software. If you have anything that's all out of the ordinary, somewhat complicated, somewhat sophisticated, get an accountant. It's cost justified. And back to number one, file on time. David Rothfleisch. File by April 30th. Thank you very much for your advice. My pleasure, Ian. Coming up, a mission to bring 16 bear cubs to safety. 16 live bear cubs, um, extremely young, uh, seemingly purchased illegally from hunters. The rescued moon bears are next in our moment. That is one of 16 new residents at a wildlife sanctuary in Laos. The moon bear cubs were brought there after being rescued from a wildlife poacher. Free the Bears, a wildlife conservation team, coordinated the rescue, one of the biggest of its kind. The cubs are now safe and receiving round-the-clock care. Right now, their main activities include playing, swimming, and lots of eating. And their rescue is our moment. Last week, we received a call from the environmental police in Vientiane Capital saying that they had conducted a raid on a illegal wildlife trader's house and had found 17 bear cubs, sadly one of which had already passed away, so 16 live bear cubs, extremely young, uh, seemingly purchased illegally from hunters. We don't know why they had purchased such a large number of bear cubs. Some of them are literally only a few weeks old. We've got a third little boy. <laughs> So they're having to be bottle fed around the clock. And obviously a huge task for our team now to try and hand raise these cubs. We're all very grateful. Very tired, but extremely grateful. It's probably the, the single largest ever rescue of endangered bear cubs worldwide. <laughs> So those are Asian black bears. They're also known as moon bears because, as you may have spotted in that last bit of video, they have kind of a crescent-shaped white patch 
on their chests. That is The National for April 12th. Join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network. And later that night, I'll be back here for The National. Have a great Saturday.